Hello and welcome to the sustainability event number six. This is, uh, today's date is July 28th, 2022. And you are joined with uh, the folks here at uh, Project Catalyst, Cardano for Climate. And the event title is Carbon and Cardano. We're here to discuss carbon issues in our little uh, community, which hopefully will have a big impact in the whole world. Certainly it will have an impact for us here today. Um, my job right now is to uh, introduce you to this meeting and give you sort of what to expect um, uh, and etc. So I will share my screen. Okay. So we're gonna take about two hours. Um, and basically our goal is to, uh, to form a discussion around carbon focused proposals in Fund 9. Um, the C4C, which you'll be introduced to more later, is, is we have an education component. And after this, we want you to know more about the climate crisis and carbon and, uh, and Cardano's role. Also about hydroheads and some technical carbon footprint calculations, which is something that I'm very interested in seeing. Um, after the orientation, after the orientation, we'll talk about what is C4C and Catalyst, and then also uh, Cardano. The next part after that will be Ryan Vucic, uh, who will give us, who will frame our discussion about climate um, calculations and our footprint, and and talk about Hydra, which is which is sort of a, a spotlight. Now, additionally, we want to promote proposals in our big list uh, of climate-centered, uh, impact-related Fund 9 proposals. And we have Danella here from uh, Universal Chemical Library. Um, who will talk about a very cool um, metaverse educational chemistry. Uh, it's, it's exciting, actually. I think it's going to be great. And then we're going to have proposals from the audience. I know that Afia is here, and I know that uh, Benet is here. They're going to talk just briefly to sort of set the conversation. Um, and then we're going to do some admin things. We've got bounties that we're going to explain to you how to, uh, to uh, participate further. And there is a feedback form, which may be in the chat right now, which is really a big goal of ours, is to figure out how this event is helping you or any kind of uh, feedback or um, if, uh, what is that other part of the word that comes in? But some, if you, you can, we can listen to you as you listen to us. And then uh, uh, listening and speaking, we'll do a lot more of that in the breakout rooms after the conversation. I would like to now give it over to Melanie, who will talk about C for C. It's interesting because I was just going through Telegram this morning and um, checking when we officially became a community. And sometime in August, we opened up the Telegram chat. It's uh, we've got three around 300 members now. And um, yeah, so it began around a fun six challenge called Climate Change the Challenge. We haven't been funded yet. Uh, fund nine, fund 10, we have it back in there again. And uh, around that challenge and around the, the humanity's greatest challenge has grown a community. We get to the next slide, please. Sure. This one is about Project Catalyst. Now, did you want to cover that? Sure. Um, I, I can actually, you know, because this is, this is sort of my story into Catalyst and Cardano for Climate is because the environment in uh, Project Catalyst is inviting. It's to provide a safe and lively environment for you to explore the highest potential in human collaboration. With that goal in mind, makes this very easy to become a community and work on this. Um, Project Catalyst itself is, uh, I don't know all the um, details on it. Somebody else, maybe Newman, you can cover the details on that one. Sure, sure. It's, you know, what I like to call it is an open source community-led governance and innovation funding mechanism. Um, you know, we're, 
we're about governance and we're sort of in the governance arm of Cardano uh, and the Cardano Foundation, IOG. Um, are, we, are we an experiment? There's a lot of, you know, it's very strange. My, my friends have different words for it as they see me interact with it day in and day out. Sean Lynch, one of our, one of our Keystone C4C members, calls it a fundamental change in how science and innovation is funded. Um, basically, his idea is that you don't have to get approved by institutions and sort of organizational structure. You get uh, this sort of citizen science direct connection to the wider Cardano and uh, innovation impact community. Um, does anyone else have like a burning, like, you know, we have a, we, we don't have to rush, we're still on time, but does anyone feel compelled to talk about Project Catalyst, like what it might mean to them in a minute or so? Or just, just, just a heads up, Cardano, what Cardano means to you is also coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's Cardano, making the world Neen, work better. Hang on a sec. Neen's got his hand up. Do it, Neen. Yeah, Cardano Catalyst to me is community. Um, we have people from all over the world, literally, who are uh, trying to trying to get together, figure how to how to get funding for their projects, um, how to write good projects to solve real world problems, and how to collaborate uh, and build something that you know they either solves for climate or or social issues or builds better technology infrastructure is literally, you know, the A to Z. There's uh, nobody is really barred. It's super, uh, it's permissionless. Anyone can join. It's something that everybody, you know, owns and everyone is invited to participate. And, you know, I I was able to meet people, meet people like Melanie and Newman, Renai and Afia, and they all are doing something. We are all doing something, right? Uh, and that's what Catalyst is about. It's a community of doers, shakers, um, and all leaders in their own right. Thank you, Neen. And Vinay, you're up next. And Sean, you just popped in, but maybe you can give your summary of what Project Catalyst is too. That's the question we're inviting the community um, to answer. Vinay. So I would say I was like introvert all my life. So at least till as in like last three years, it is more of like framing this entire thing. As a person, building the team, I was sort of like uh, I would watch people what they do. I don't go talk to them, but as in on the forum, but I would approach them like in in multiple ways. Got the entire team together, the framework is done, but finally from an int introvert to an extrovert. So the transition happened with uh, Catalyst, where I was always scared to like just go host something, talk to people. So that was always there, the stage fear. I would say it, it entirely changed being like, how it started to like, how, where we are right now, after like six months of, uh, in, in fact, if you see like a lot of, uh, like what Nin says, all of us, we meet, but we don't meet on regular basis, but we still meet. But when we meet, there's a conversation that would like, it, it's like a blast of ideas blast of collaborations we're like okay this is where we are this is where we were this is where we are right now this is where we should be so that is what happened so let's say yeah peaks of collaboration <laughs> thank you awesome sean do you have a something to pipe in about project catalyst hey guys i'm always good to chat um for <laughs> me project catalyst is what it means to be human so Project Catalyst is about sharing ideas. It's about getting ideas funded. It's about working on ideas together. And uh, you know, ideas are something that need to be shared. And the more that we share ideas, the better society gets. And uh, so for me, Project Catalyst is all about listening to people, uh, learning from people, 
having this huge global opportunity and now backed by like this decentralized funding instrument. So I think it's really powerful. And for me, it's uh, it, it gives me faith and hope in humanity. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that feels that feels like the environment that I want to participate in. You know, uh, we, we get a choice of how we spend our time. And one of those collaborations that uh, was brought was brought to me, or sort of happened, like Vinay says, like when you you can kind of get out of your uh, get out of one's bubble, was uh, meeting Ryan Ryan Vukic. He uh, just dropped into a meeting, and you know, and I had not heard about. I mean, I'd heard about car, uh, car carbon footprint, but it was very opaque to me. Uh, he did a really great job of uh, explaining the the hydrohead and sort of why it matters. So I'd like to invite Ryan up to say hello. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, it's uh, good to be back, I guess. <laughs> Ryan is a very old school OG Catalyst member, um, uh, has been around as, uh, do, folks, do folks know Ryan? Ryan, do you recognize folks here? Yep, some some people. Yeah, I think I was uh, C4C in August when it when the Telegram kicked off, you know, in the Discord and all that. and. Uh, I just had to uh, go and find my way in Cardano to figure out how to make all these things happen. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, Cardano is a great project, still in development, obviously, and uh, I, I just wanted to know how the rubber hit the road eventually and, and how that works. So I've kind of taken a couple months to do that in the background. And and where the rubber meets the road is this carbon footprint in your mind. Um, because that really underlies everything that we do. Um, you can't really, you can't really go far without sort of carbon, you know, carbon credits, carbon sequestration. I, I was traveling just recently, and it was the first time that I had really looked at that form on the airline ticket that said, "Do, do you want to offset your carbon?" Um, I'm starting to notice it now, and thanks to you, and thanks to this event, and I hope that works for everyone here. It's just like let's start to notice our carbon footprint. Is this a good segue to begin your, you know, you uh, taken taken uh, on the mic, Ryan? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, absolutely. And and even more than a carbon footprint, uh, you know, microplastics, glyphosates, um, Cardano was a unique uh, project in, in that I believe it can handle and track most of those for us, uh, as easy as our bank account tracks our balance. Um, and that's what really drew me to Cardano and has uh, kept me here. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's other proof of stake chains and there's, uh, you know, Ethereum's gonna be headed towards proof of stake, um, but I still think Cardano with its native tokens and, and, and different features um, enables for, for better stuff. Uh, so, and that's yeah. exactly, yeah, that's exactly when I tell people that I'm in crypto, that's the first thing they ask. It's like, oh, that's going to burn up the whole planet with the energy uh -huh. use and stuff. It's like, well, there's something else to it and that it really can benefit. hundred percent. Um, you know, uh, you know, public, I, I don't own any NFTs. Um, I, I think it's a, I think it's a great thing, but to me, crypto isn't NFTs and, uh, and, and I think the ability of smart contracts and to, um, you know, program and write in uh, our interactions with each other just holds tremendous benefit to what we do. Uh, I, I've spent a lot of time in my past career, I like to say, uh, mediating disputes and um, dealing with contracts. And I would really love to just have the contracts say what they say and people meet their features and we and we walk on you know meet the terms of the contract and and everybody walks away happy and, and i think this is an opportunity for us technologically to kind of change how we view and interact with each other and and we can add a whole bunch more benefits to it as well let's um because i think this gets us in and one of the things i hope that you talk about is this uh in in our conversations about the different parts of the economy is now a good time to sort of get into that? I think so, yep. Let's do it. So, so what, we, what we have here 
obviously we have sectors of the economy. Um, there, there's three or five, uh, depending on who you talk to and, and, and who you deal with. Um, primary, secondary, tertiary, that's, that's how we break down the interactions we have in this $80 trillion world economy right now. Um, oh, and this is, my slide didn't get updated. I did type something besides Latin in there, I promise. I saw that, I was gonna sneak in there. I was gonna sneak in there and try to shit. But uh, no worries, no worries. We're among family. We're among friendly uh, family here, so don't. Yeah. Uh, so to you know, just a quick snapshot: primary economy, uh, anything directly tied to the land. You know, whether it's mining, whether it's logging, whether it's fishing, uh, anything that is harvesting uh, goods or services straight from the land. You know, and, and we all know industries that that do this and. Um, you know, they bundle it all together. They, they put the manpower and the equipment together and they deliver a product, be it lithium now is, is a big thing or oil, you know, um, all things, you know, lumber that, that come directly off the land. And these are those first companies that, that deal with that. Uh, and then you move on to a secondary economy, you know, uh, where you have the trees and then you mill the trees into usable boards or you have the crude oil and you refine it into plastics, into you know, kerosenes, into all the other stuff that we use on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and then you get in the tertiary economy where we interact with it. Um, we go buy it and we consume it. You know, we burn the oil, we build the houses, we eat the vegetables. Um, and, and I really got into this because I think it's important to frame all of our different projects into the system uh, as it currently exists. You know, if, if there is a, a project that wants to put an NFT to land, um, that's a great project, but how does that, in it, that land NFT interact with the secondary economy? Uh, does it become a huge transaction that has, you know, 10 people track it before it gets to a consumer? Um, you know, how does that oil, do we look at an oil transaction on the blockchain and see where it was, uh, where it was drilled and pumped? Uh, it, it's, that it's unsustainable to look at it that way because there's so much data in those transactions once we do 10 of them. Um, it, it really just didn't, doesn't work. And so, you know, it led me into scalability issues and, and, and how is Cardano going to scale? Um, and, and so I've been diving into hydroheads and so, yeah, give us, give us the, yeah, the, the scalability, because that sounds very sort of wide, like un, unmanageable, like, well, so how can, how can hydroheads help in this? And just what does the scalability issue mean? So I've been looking at the hydroheads and if you want to go to, um, the next slide, please, Newman. Here we go. Hydroheads right now, as they are uh, explained to us, and, and obviously maybe we're Q3, maybe we're Q4 of this year when, we, um, when, when they're live. So they're still very, very basic. Um, it is a poker table. Uh, say Newman, Melanie, and myself agree to open a Hydrahead and we all sign in and exchange our passwords we can trade uh, money between ourselves. You know, we can trade ADA between ourselves and we can, do, we can trade it as many times as we want with only the last transaction snapshot being represented by the main chains. So we could have a hundred transactions amongst ourselves and only be paying for one transaction. Right. But and that I, would, yeah, yep, go ahead. But what I think the real benefit of a Hydra head is 100 transactions between Newman, Melanie, and I that deal with native tokens on the Cardano blockchain. And I see us trading food NFTs. I see us trading carbon credits. I see us trading a whole bunch of stuff in one of these sectors of the economies 
and then taking a snapshot of a whole sector of an economy and letting that move on to the next one. Exactly, Melanie, bounties with gimbal tokens, you know, but we can, we can do 10 tokens. Um, so it can be gimbal and it can be an impact CO2 token and it can be a methane token because everything we do, even this Zoom meeting, you know, right now this Zoom meeting, we're emitting whatever, a kilogram of CO2. And that should be shared amongst all these participants because we choose to join this and we are responsible for the impact of that kilogram amongst ourselves. So and let's, yeah, yeah, let's talk about, because I feel like that's a good transition about like the personal carbon footprint and, and how this helps us manage it. Would, would there, I'm assuming that, that there would be a coin or an, a, an app that helps me manage my footprint and that Hydrahead would keep me off of the main net like causing a bigger a bigger footprint is that sort of am I on the right track there? I, I think it would deal with the transactions that we accrue our carbon footprint with off the main net. Okay. Um, a hydra head is still isomorphic, so that means all the data in a hydra head, as far as the token transactions, will be represented on the main chain. Because as after we close the head and take the snapshot, if I have accrued 100 gimbal tokens, that will show that that is a, a main net balance, a level one balance. So whatever I accrue in a hydro head will then be my main net balance. Okay. And that, that's part of the isomorphic state. So, you know, it, 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 it's great like that, but it would just allow for I think we have what 16 participants right now. So we could distribute this, uh, say there was a, a CO2 token in here representing the one kilogram. We could distribute it amongst ourselves and all change it and have all that in one transaction as well as any gimbal tokens or anything else we're doing and take a snapshot of this. And we would all leave this party, if you will, this Zoom party with those new token balances. Yeah, okay. It, it's a lot. So this slide here, this is a, uh, this is something I put together real quick for, uh, I, I'm working with a, a farm um, and they have given me access to all their data. They, they harvest every day, they weigh their uh, products. They have, I think 10 different vegetables and I said, let's work up a carbon footprint. So I have access to their utility bills. I have uh, access, they have, they have the solar installation that, that uh, does about 25% of their power. And I am going to give them a footprint for every pound of vegetables that comes out based on that monthly uh, outlay of, of their activities, be it utilities, be it employees driving to there, all the supplements that will be used that month. So when they go and sell a pound of tomatoes at the farmer's market, they will know that it took 70 grams of CO2 to produce that pound of tomatoes. Right. Now that's, that's what, uh, that's sort of what I envision is like that there will be something that helps me to figure out the the carbon foot and this is this has to do with supply chain basically supply chain like what i interact with and what that what that footprint and uh but then it's not just footprint it's about like unadulterated products and uh food security um all, all kinds of things uh that, that that happen now there are there are downsides i would imagine as well um uh but yeah let's uh we can continue there now if you had this, and we were talking about the that there is a lot of infrastructure already in place, like ISO and the and this uh, the barcodes and SKUs, um, you would see. I mean, can you envision that this would uh, would sort of happen? You know, with the old economy, as I mean, it's not like a complete redo. It's like we do have supply chains, and we do have you know uh, ways of managing this. I, I agree, but what we don't have is a way of managing anything beyond cash in a uh -huh. transaction. So if I go and buy that pound of tomatoes, I can give them 
$5. I, I, I can't really receive a golden ticket that has, oh, I lost it. I can't really receive a golden ticket that has uh, 50 grams of CO2. It, it really doesn't accrue. Um, you know, and what a what blockchain allows, and, and specifically Cardano with its native tokens, is if I do a ADA transaction, uh, am I frozen again? You're good on this end, uh, Brian. It, it, what, what Cardano allows is for me to accrue those in my wallet, uh, the same as cash. It, you know, and, and Melanie uh, knows this term, multidimensional accounting. Um, you know, we can, we can accrue a, a multiple things in our wallets as we do blockchain transactions. So we can accrue carbon, we can accrue methane, we can accrue microplastics. And, and all these can happen in the same transaction that we transfer funds for these things. Okay. Okay. And good things and good things happen with that. I mean, you know, one of the things, so this is, uh, yeah, this is about uh, seeing and listening to the environment and what we interact with and what the, what the carbon is in our in our in our supply chains uh, another way of thinking of just what we interact with um does anyone else have uh comments or questions for ryan as we sort of will wrap bruno, up bruno had his hand up for a little bit um bruno do you yeah, have yeah. some burn in there I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna come back i'm gonna come back i'm still gathering some tools <laughs> so i don't want to say anything to it so and let me, one of these things I'm doing with this farm, uh, there, there's a common Google sheet that they use with about 15 tabs that is common to 20 farmers in this area. And so I am going to change uh, one of their tabs to represent um, CO2. And, and, and it's gonna be based on each individual farm's efforts and activities. And this is, this is hive mind. We, these are all shared amongst each other. And we can see if tomatoes from farm A are coming out at 50 grams a pound, tomatoes from farm B are at 75 grams of CO2 a pound. And we are going to share this information amongst ourselves and hopefully lower the carbon footprint, um, you know, holistically of this whole group of farms. We have some aquaponics, some hydroponics, some indoor, some outdoor, conventional. Uh, you know, we're really going to have a snapshot of everything. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a first step. I can see how this all lives on the blockchain. Um, we're not there yet, uh, especially without hydro heads. Uh, but, but, I, but we're trying to build the infrastructure behind and the understanding of how, how this would work uh, so that we can do it on blockchain and really leverage the different uh, strengths of it. Let's get uh, let's get uh, one George. more maybe, maybe one more question uh, maybe from no, George. George. George has got George. his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Newman, Melanie. Good good uh, discussion, Ryan, and good to see the market. You have put it as a primary, secondary, and tertiary. Um, because when we, uh, for example, we look at um, China, we say, okay, this is burning a lot of fuel, but uh, the thing is. Uh, that is the part where it is uh, starting and the products are being shipped all over the world. So there is a share for everyone. It's not just the share of one region. And that even with, uh, um, when we look at uh, forests being destroyed in Amazon or any other country uh, for wood, and we say, okay, they are doing it, but the wood where it is going, what are the raw materials being, uh, produce from that and how is it uh, you know, utilized for uh, construction in US, for example, or any other Western nation. Um, and so the progression uh, to see all these three factions and distribute the carbon footprint across instead of holding one country accountable for uh, the issue. So uh, a very powerful thought process in that, uh, what we have initiated. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, 
the consumers need to accrue the uh, impact of their purchases. You know, we, we, will, we will never be able to control uh, 186 countries and their exports and, and their policies on what they do. You know, but if we are accruing those values, um, we'll be able to make decisions based on that. And we'll also, in a way, force their hands to do better you know, as they start losing market share because we're informed. Yeah, that's transparency, I think. I think that's what the whole transparent, radical transparency and, yeah. Um, so, so guys, just ahead, two, yeah. sec two seconds here. We've got some troll action and it's it's absolutely it's ridiculous. Pretty, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous unnerving. that we have to do it. So what's happening is we've got somebody coming in, uh, copying our names and and coming back in and uh a lot of them are are maybe co-hosts at this point um so let's just identify who it is sadly uh you know that this is happening and we're waiting melanie it. it's a uh, it's the second new man uh, the second new man. Oh, yeah, okay he so doesn't have he doesn't have uh the snail on him so essentially yeah. if you click on yeah, person. I've removed oh, I've removed them. Perfect. So thank you. We have RV, uh, we have Cole Bennett, Sustainable Ada co-host CB. Uh, That's it. Any, you got rid of him. Uh, so that was it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so just uh. as co everybody's co-host in here, almost everybody. So you know this can be a little bit of an issue because you know we're trusting and we expect people to be honorable like us um so newman co-host uh, you have the one, one i'm the real one i'm the non-bot one look it's me i'm a i'm a i'm a real boy i'm a real boy so i had i had removed one and i'm just looking at um a report um so just okay so bear with me on this it you. was something that i really didn't expect you're still yeah, there was, i hope yeah yeah but i'm still here i'm still so, here you know, no we're a trusting bunch and it's not something that we expect to happen because we're trying to get stuff done. And, you know, and then this is, this is, yeah, cool. So we had people come in from people that we know, like Daniel Rebar with the name Daniel Rebar, Sebastian Pavon. Oh. And so I don't know, I'm not a hundred percent sure I didn't kick the real ones out, but I had personal messages that were not what Daniel would have sent me. So um, just be aware that this is happening and put your hand up. I'm not used to this. So um, I don't know how this works typically. And um, we'll, we're, we've got a video editor that will edit this video. So we, <laughs> it would be nice, it'd be nice. Um, well, what is interesting is that moment. this works, this works in the real world as well, because uh, you have many uh, organizations such as like Climate Council, Sustainability, Business Alliance, and so, and so on. And these organizations are paid by fossil fuel uh, companies, and uh, they uh, exist uh, to uh, create disinformation. And this is a real uh, tactic that is uh, occurring in the real world for the past several decades. So you cannot be trusted it's it's difficult because you know and this becomes a teachable moment doesn't it you know like it seems like a really weird thing to happen uh sometimes we feel like questions that we get given it's like it throws us off for a little bit Ooh, didn't see that side but we don't have to be afraid of this you yeah. know we can address it if we have these questions um ask them don't be afraid to ask them and that's the beautiful part about project catalyst to me is that we live in this safe and um, inviting environment where we can talk. Um, I feel sorry for a troll that comes along and feels that this is the way they've got to get attention or disrupting things. I don't know, I'm gonna sit for some time and try and understand why, um, but yeah, let's not be afraid of that. Just- Okay, uh, okay. Leave, um, it in the, leave it in the recording even it doesn't bother me there you go that sounds perfect that sounds yeah. perfect um but in the interest of time let's let's move uh, right along um i um wrapping up ryan let's 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 give one so we've got a so we've got a bow on this part because we do have sort of a sort of a shift over um to 
sort of an educational and sort of the science fiction to me, like nano nanotech, like not not looking at the carbon sequestration, uh, the carbon uh, in the economy, but trying to bring it out and and really the education component of what it is and 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 working with young people and like this uh, metaverse. Uh, which we'll we'll talk about with Danella uh, in a second. But Ryan, just to just to wrap up, do you have any do you have any closing closing remark or how maybe people could get in touch with you? Um, are you willing to hang out for a breakout room if people have more things? I I think you know just to kind of um, build on your point there. Uh, how do you build on it? We, we talk about CO two. We couldn't be further removed from a chemical equation of CO2. You know, I think blockchain would allow us to actually see CO2 from a chemical standpoint and see as it travels through the economy. And that's what I'm talking about. It's not a credit. It's not a, it's a real physical um, chemical, you know, chemical compound. And I think that blockchain allows us to track that and, and to look at that chemical reaction that happens in the different products we do and accrue that and accrue methane and accrue microplastics yeah. because that's what's happening. You know, a, a refinery is cracking these things and, and, and fracking them and, and making these compounds. I, I think we can track them ultimately. Excellent. And, and that is a, you know, that's a difference. It's, it's less ob obfuscation. It's, yeah. It's very real and transparent. Yeah, and I think that segues beautifully into um, our, uh, our 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 proposal spotlight of the chemical compounds. Um, it, now, um, I don't know exactly how to pronounce your name, but if you could come, uh, Danila. Danila. Uh, yeah. Well, welcome, Danila. Thank you so much. If uh, if you don't mind, would you help us to uh, interact with your proposal? Yes, um, I, I will. Quick question, Danila Medvedev. Medvedev, yes. are you tennis? <laughs> Not related. Uh, my father, my my father's <laughs> name actually is Andrei Medvedev, uh, same as the tennis player. Nice, <laughs> same, awesome. very same. Awesome. So uh, there was the recording, uh, the quick little recording, but you have your own slides, right, Danila? Yeah, perfect. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I think I finished it. So uh, the project that I'm talking about uh, is uh, Nano Web, and it's uh, submitted to Catalyst uh, Fund 9 as Universal Chemical Library. And uh, it has several angles. Uh, and um, this uh, all is intended uh, to help uh, create um, a next generation uh, manufacturing technology. Uh, as you've seen in uh, Ryan Vukic's uh, presentation, uh, there is this primary, secondary economy, uh, and we have this uh, traditional way of thinking that we have these extractive industries, uh, oil and gas and all the minerals, uh, and then it's moved into factories where we shape it and then eventually we produce finished goods. Uh, nanotechnology, as originally envisioned, uh, is a way to completely um, leave behind uh, this old model um, of um, industry. Uh, nanotechnology is about taking individual atoms and then uh, just shaping from them whatever we, we want. Because everything in the world, uh, mostly everything, uh, consists of atoms and molecules, uh, including humans, including livestock, including all our gadgets. Uh, if we can optimize this uh, reshuffling of uh, molecules and atoms, uh, we can potentially get a much more efficient um, uh, uh, industry replacement. So uh, one um, aspect in particular where non-technology might uh, contribute uh, is um, dealing with climate change and in particular uh, CO2 uh, capture, removal and uh, fixing. And uh, I want to focus uh, on this. Okay. So, 
Uh, as you all know, greenhouse gases are a major reason for climate change, and that's a problem we have to deal with, and it's about uh, carbon dioxide, uh, CO2, uh, to uh, oxygens, one carbon, and what we would like ideally to have is some very efficient machine uh, which can just remove uh, uh, carbon uh, from that, uh, fix it into something like a diamond, for example, drop it somewhere in the desert, uh, and then uh, process uh, uh, all the those gigatons of carbons from the atmosphere. Uh, there are existing carbon capture solutions um, uh, such as this uh, plant, for example, uh, which use different uh, tricks uh, to use uh, energy, uh, usually solar energy, uh, to uh, process um, uh, carbon dioxide and do something with it, like in this case, uh, create um, uh, gas, create fuel, uh, which uh, is not a fossil fuel, but was created from air. Uh, the problem with these technologies is that they are ultimately industrial technologies. So they need uh, a lot of materials, they need a lot of equipment, uh, you need uh, people, builders, uh, engineers uh, coming and setting, this, uh, setting things up. For example, this plant, it has uh, all those um, uh, 169 mirrors uh, on the ground. Each mirror has a motor, it has a sensor, so it rotates and focuses light uh, on the tower. And all that is complicated equipment, uh, which uh, to build, we need uh, energy and essentially we need fossil fuels. So it's not a very good way to remove carbon dioxide uh, if we emit more of it uh, into the atmosphere. So the problem is how to scale this. And the advantage of nanotechnology is that because uh, it's uh, very direct, it's uh, you take atoms, you put them together, you have a final product. You don't need all those processing. You don't need all this logistic. Uh, because of that, nanotechnology can potentially be uh, an order of magnitude or orders of magnitude more efficient than traditional, traditional industrial uh, processes. And uh, because uh, it only uses a limited number of parts, it uses just atoms and essentially like 20 atoms would be mostly enough for any nanotech applications you might need. And it can mostly use carbon and carbon is uh, and in the atmosphere. That's what we want to extract. And it's a good thing that carbon is very, uh, uh, they're a good material. It can be a conductor, it can be a semiconductor, it can be insulated, it can be strong, it can, it exists in different uh, allotopes. Uh, so you can have uh, carbon nanotubes, you can have graphene, you can have uh, graphite, uh, so many different uh, forms, uh, one uh, chemical element. So um, because of that, a nanotech solution uh, is something that you can potentially design once, build once, and then you just scale it exponentially using nanotechnology itself, atomic manufacturing. And then you can have a huge uh, uh, automated plant in the desert, uh, which just captures uh, huge amounts of carb carbon dioxide. So uh, the way to this uh, is that first we have to develop nanomachines. And um, there is a problem with existing nanotechnology industry. Uh, it was uh, envisioned um, in the 20th century by Eric Drexler uh, as uh, nano factories, nano robots. Uh, but uh, instead of actually developing this capability, all countries, uh, including United States, including Russia, including China, uh, instead uh, spread their attention on anything nano-like uh, and scientists uh, completely lost focus and they didn't create these nano machines. They instead created many cool publications in scientific journals, uh, which is good, but uh, not very useful. Uh, so we need uh, to um, create a, a number of innovations that would uh, lead to these nano machines. And then we can use nano machines to build carbon capture nano systems. That is machines which are also built at the nano level, at the atomic level, but that are focused on uh, taking CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, taking carbon out, releasing oxygen and building something uh, from this carbon. And then we would get this scaled nano systems. And the good thing is that uh, it requires almost zero additional investment, zero marginal cost, because nano machines uh, can um, replicate themselves uh, because uh, they um, basically do not require humans in the loop. Uh, it's like um, artificial intelligence and robotics, only even better uh, because uh, chemistry is um, 
like easier and simpler than operating in the macro world. Uh, so what we're doing with uh, NanoLab project is uh, we have created a, a virtual reality interface uh, where you can uh, use your hands uh, uh, if you're wearing uh, Oculus uh, Quest 2 um, virtual reality helmet, you can use your hands uh, to just take atoms, uh, move them around and uh, uh, shape them uh, into molecules. And this is both an educational product and a design product for nano engineers and for chemists. And in addition to that, we would need to add um, a computer added design uh, CAD um, uh, aspect for cataloging parts and for uh, building the more complicated uh, systems and create a decentralized platform to support um, innovation uh, so that we can have uh, people around the world developing individual parts like uh, somebody needs uh, uh, a connector or maybe somebody needs a lock or maybe somebody needs uh, like a more complicated thing like a counter or maybe a gear or something, uh, a brick. And then other people would uh, develop it, uh, put it uh, into a distributed system. And then somebody would uh, build uh, more complex machines out of those parts. Okay, uh, okay. let's, um, if you don't mind, uh, Danila, yeah. I I would love for you if you could just wrap it up just a bit so that we could get to a break. We could yeah, because it's, so we could get to a breakout. Thank room. you. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the latest uh, the, the last slide is uh, what we envision in terms of uh, uh, milestones. Uh, like uh, we can spend the next ten to fifteen years creating and designing these nano systems, and then it would take like ten years to actually build the carbon capture systems, and then. Uh, with this uh, ability to exponentially build this capacity, it would take like 10 years uh, to have the 300 billion tons of carbon captured, and we would be back to pre-industrial levels of CO2, and hopefully our climate uh, issues would become uh, less serious because of that, even though that would obviously not solve it completely. So that's um, what uh, we have in mind. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. And thank you for sharing this. And 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 you and this is and because is this part of your proposal? Well, we'll, we'll talk more in the in the uh, in the breakout room because I know that we have a ton of questions. So I'm going to leave it with a cliffhanger, um, and we will uh, ask if uh, there are any proposers here. I know that Kanma is here, and I'd like to hear from them. Um, the real Dylan is here. I'd love to hear about algae, but if you could just introduce, because we're recorded and we're going to be on YouTube, just introduce your projects, then, you know, just in a minute, uh, and then we can discuss further in the, in the breakout rooms. Um, uh, Vinay, could, I'm, I'm really curious about your, um, your green uh, initiative at the CONMA. If you could just give like a minute, a minute uh, of, of introduction to what it is. Hey, Newman. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're a little soft, but go ahead. Now? Yeah. So guys, again, it, it's more of like experiments we do on day-to-day -day basis. Everything is an experiment. So we've been experimenting. So pitch ground was an experiment to how I started off. We would say we've been working on this for over oh, three years now. It took us three years to build our back end. It took us like only since like for, uh, fund seven is when we actually were able to reach the community as in like, how do we take this forward? Okay. 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 Yeah. That's, um, I do think that you guys have, because you, it seems like you have a focus. Um, there's a good amount of focus on impact. More of like, uh, people care, earth care and fair share. Yeah. When it comes to people care, we have few programs of Conma that we've been testing. If you see pitch ground is more of like a platform for people to like pitch. Now Conma sprout, what we got funded for is a totally different ideation platform. Earthcare, when it comes to Earthcare, 
uh, algae cultivation we are already uh, since we have dylan here I, i would tell you the future is algae why single cell single plant cell that can like in fact if you see earth is usable meaning algae is what brought the entire life to earth is what you can like actually say right is the first living organism that started off with so right now if you if you see the like a million algae species but we know only 30000 a million to a 30 yeah so, yeah uh thank you thank you vinay uh, dylan what do you think i mean I think that algae is a part of the carbon future. I mean, I think that we will we'll look definitely. back. Yeah, we'll look back and say, "Oh, that was before the big giant algae farms." Well, yeah, as as just said, like algae was pretty much started life on earth. All all the um fossil fuels are just really old algae. Um we we're, we're living off algae already for energy, but there's um they also give more that's what started the the atmosphere and the oxygen so so that's what's converting most of the co2 to oxygen already and um we were just talking about nanotechnology one of um the the founders of algae token their partner uh, works in nanotechnology as well they're another chemical engineer um but we we've been looking at uh carbon capture units uh, around the world there's people in switzerland there's people in canada and here in australia uh csiro are uh, doing carbon capture and we're involved with them we're we're deep in the research being at universities uh into co2 capture um regards to algae token we um you know we've been setting up these farms around the world uh for 15 years and and focusing on food fuel a feed stock for animals um now it's all good for the food but the um the co2 we're looking one of one of our proposals is a esg based uh recording so that can be um validated compared to just normal commercial ways but doing it on the blockchain so that's one of our sort of endeavors as well that we plan on doing so we've got um multiple facets of sort of social impact there from from helping malnutrition um to you know food securities it's it's being highlighted more and more how much we're actually running out of food and how this planet will be sustainable uh but doing this in in a way that also reduces climate effects uh is is the key and the beauty about algae is it doesn't compete with arable lands agricultural water so that's the biggest problem with agricultural farming the water supply and we're using it up we're also running out of fresh water on the planet <laughs> so there's there's a lot of a lot of things that need to go into place that um is like key to this and and it's definitely a a market that is going to be huge it's been recognized by uh the world health organization and the uh unicef and um all the, all the big ones now that it is a new superfood uh and it will be um when it when it's grown correctly and you you've got a pure culture uh it is something that you know i i eat myself it is so many uh nutritional ve- benefits in there but it's just the best way of making protein instead of cutting down the forest planting soybeans <laughs> we can <laughs> we can grow this in the desert like yeah with, I, uh, with ocean water it's just i'm like uh, i'm so glad that you are here to sort of set that off and it's beautiful how little connections vinay i'm coming to you right in just a second um beautiful how connections happen like nanotech i would not have put nanotech I guess I know that Danella was going to be here. Uh but it, all of a sudden, yes, algae is I mean, I feel like algae is nanotech. Um and, and I want to discuss this. I want to discuss this in the breakout room. But first I want to get to Vinay and then we're going to wrap up um wrap up this part of the presentational uh part and then and then we're open to discussion. I hope that you can kind of stay and hang out. Um I know that you guys are all in different time zones and all over the world. Um So but I respect your time and uh, let's hear from Pete. Oh, you did buddy. You one thing. ESG, <laughs> environmental social governance. So what happens is 
algae what we are talking about so when it comes to environment till date we've been following something called a kyoto protocol right so kyoto protocol is more of like a protocol that would calculate your carbon emissions to your carbon offset mm-hmm. which is as in like never followed by most of the world and what next now if you, if you see it is more of like esg growing algae algae takes a lot of carbon yeah but is there a common as in like it's it's more of like a blockchain right again when it comes to blockchain every country has its own jurisdiction their own laws the same way now now we are like waiting for more of a unified framework or when it comes to blockchain we, we, we want a unified framework where we don't want indians to charge 49% taxes and different countries varying on when it comes to rules right the same way now carbon credits is more of who is counting these carbon credits right. the government validate who actually counts it uh, or there's there's a work around or probably it's it's more of like we need to advocate for it right if you see right now i i don't know what the current situation is with uh, or or what algae token has been doing but we've been in algae cultivation for over uh, 13 years now so right now we have uh, the red algae to green algae to blue algae will give you a lot of as in like all the health benefits yes but all these all the algae what we are growing it's been absorbing carbon now who valuates it is there a, again when it comes to not just valuating carbon it's all of like valuating the product what we are growing fda accreditation meaning if you grow algae spirulina chlorella yeah beta carotenoids there like a lot of algae that you would grow but ultimately who would like certify it fda certifying it all right i'll say it's a scam <laughs> that that's perfect yeah yeah decentralization yeah right? but uh, let's go i i i because this is the cliffhanger because i want to take it i want to let me just skip get through my slides i hate to exert so you like walk right from scratch okay um yeah let's um yeah yeah uh bruno uh and dylan if you want to make a, a short comment because i would love to get through and then we can we can sort of wrap up this portion and then go on to uh, uh the wider discussion then we'll have free range and then i can i can relax a bit more of, it's more of like advocacy we need to like start we need to start somewhere yeah well this there's, there's many different methodologies for calculating these things scientifically um and there needs to be sort of a a validation on those methodologies to make sure it works but then there's also like it's the whole system so if you're validating sort of carbon credits or something like that you need to look at all of your processes someone else is waking up so it's making coffee at four in the morning um there's yes yeah, so it's the whole process so how you how you're dealing with um your your processes so how you drying algae how you transporting the goods in the end uh there's the, there's a whole life cycle of that so the each step of the way so you, you can't just look at a uh, we could just look at a simple system of just uh growing cultivating the algae how much input output there is but then it's all processes along the way and each different person does different processes so they uh all that needs to be entailed and calculated it's a difficult thing and then where do you stop i mean it gets to the people the people working there how much co2 are they using things like that there's so many little tiny things that could be implemented and there needs to be a standard because you can quite easily you know with um different different ways get different 
you know, count different processes and say, well, this is this is how much we're using, but it's not actually accurate. So there needs to be more of a, a model system that everyone can use. It's like completely different to, um, well, no, it's the same. I've done a uh, work in uh, forest sequestration, like carbon sequestration uh, in, in trees and things like that. And there's so many multitudes of methodologies. And as, as was just said, different countries have different methodologies that they follow. There are strict sort of ones in different countries uh, and different jurisdictions, but um, it's difficult. It's a difficult process. And to do it correctly is the thing that we all need to get together and decide the best methodology and how to do it. Collaboration again, yeah. Okay, yeah, for sure. Um Benes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll wait because I just want to do this next little thing, and then we'll go into the breakout rooms. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna share the screen, and I'm bringing it over here, and all that stuff. Okay, okay. So here we are. The this is a long list of, and I can share this in the chat of the impact proposals or, or the carbon related um, proposals from our big list. Um, take a peek at that, and I'm hoping that Cole will help me uh, mark that in the appropriate way. And I don't know where my actual slides went off to. Are they here? No. Mm, boy, that is not what I wanted. Let's see. There's New York City. Huh. Okay. Well, no, that's back again. <laughs> oh, guys, I'm sorry. Where did it go? Um, anyway, the um, the next thing I want to get to is the um, I'm just going to not share my screen and I'm going to get to uh, get on the list. If you have a proposal or, you know, one or you see one, uh, make it onto this list. Um, here's a form to do it. And then there's the CO2 proposals. Um, I'm just going to go through the slides, even though you can't see it. There is a bounty for this um, this per, uh, this uh, attendance to this event, uh, which you can sign up for and on DWORK. And okay, there is a um, the feedback form that I want you to fill out, and please do. And there's something easy that you can do about trolls. Oh, I'm robotic. I'm roboting out. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the feedback form is right here. So please, please, please fill this out. It's how I get. Uh, it's how I get my pay. Um, and man, I would love for you to see these slides. Uh, I'm going to try one more time to find it in my list of things. Oh, it's right here. It's not right there. Sorry, guy, gang. They just they went oh, they went away on me. Oh, is it here? No. It sounds like you might have too much open. Um because we are getting you breaking in and out. I just DM them to you, uh, Newman. Okay. Here we go. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. This last one, feedback. Are you guys seeing my screen? Maybe not. Yeah, you're still, it still sounds like you might have a, a lot of stuff open. Okay. Huh. Now better, better now. Okay, so this, this is the feedback form and you've got a link there. And this is our sort of thank you and uh, send off uh, to the breakout rooms. Um, you can, this is a Cardano for Climate event. Uh, you can find us on Telegram and Discord and Twitter. Uh, we have a website, a YouTube channel. There's a meetup. There's a link tree. Those, uh, those links could be uh, coming into the uh, chat right now. Um, yep. And then you can get a, a C4C logo for sure. And um, Let's begin our our uh, our conversation because I am uh, that wraps that up. Please fill out the form. Um, 
thank you, thank you for joining. And let's stay here for as long as we need to talk about this. Uh, about this, uh, I, I love the idea of 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 algae. I'm super glad that Dylan showed up. I know that it's super. It's late in the or, or early in the morning, late at night. Um, I would love to hear more from Danilla. Um, and then I think Ryan has got the good sort of critical catalyst uh, uh, thing or Cardano thing uh, down. So I'm really looking forward to a great conversation and we can take however long we want. Um, so, and thank you, thank you for joining. Um, and, we, and I don't, I think we can all just stay here in this one room. Yeah, unless... I'm just gonna suggest it's a small group and we stay in the same room. I do have to skedaddle, so I'm going to let you guys at it. Um, if you do happen to go into another breakout room, make sure you're co-host so that you can record and we can upload it to YouTube. Just a little bit of admin going on. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, just stay in this main room. And Newman, I'm just going to suggest you shut everything down except what you really need open. Because okay. for some reason, you're breaking up through cyberspace. Yeah. Um, any any other comments or questions before we go anywhere? How are you all doing? Good. Seems I'm missing like the the five star rating on the Carbon and Cardano event feedback form. <laughs> <laughs> it's the five star. Oh, so man. yeah, there's lots to iterate, lots to do. I've been I I um, kicked out uh, Saban. Uh, Sebastian by mistake. I think there was an alias, a troll in there as well. And it's like, I've been trying to fix that. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I saw him. Things, I saw him. We'll, we'll, that is happen. a big thing. And, and you can put that down on the, uh, on the feedback form. So immediately you have some good feedback because I would love for us to unpack it in the, in the future. We do these uh, each month. Um, we uh, we try to sort of offer it as a as a place to focus our conversations and get folks on the um, uh, on the recording. Um, thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, if you've got anything, uh, please uh, hang around, or um, we'll see you next time. Okay. Thanks all. Enjoy okay. the rest of this meeting. All right. Bye, Melanie. Bye, Melanie. All right. All right. So let's talk. Let's talk nanotech. Algae, sorry, I, carbon. Sorry, one more thing. I have to make somebody host before I leave. Okay. Let's see. Uh, hang on, okay. I can do that. No problem. Yeah, either Cole or I would be good. I'm gonna. Let's see if we can do oh, the man. fake coal. Should we do the fake coal or the troll coal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which one? Okay. Here, look, look, look. I'm the I'm the real one. Look, Cole, look. Cole, you okay being host? He's good. He's good. Yeah. Okay, okay. good. Ah. I I envision I I want if I don't have in the water there's a really cool project with water uh water harvesting which I just think would be just a cool version of the future. Um but then algae farms, you know, in every science fiction story it seems nanotech and algae are part of it. I really want that to happen. And, um, and yeah, I do think that it could help the environment. I could think it would help sustain us here, but it, uh, on top of that, I think it would be really cool. Um, uh, you know, I just, I just, I just love the idea of growing the own food. I love the idea of, uh, and actually Danella's sort of thing about this industrial process is not what, listen to this, this, this is the idea. It's not what, but how. So the what is, you know, energy production uh, and the how can be like, you know, um, uh, you know, this nanotech or, or uh, what's the folks that are getting heat from uh, composting. Composting is another sort of nanotech thing. It's happening at this little teeny level. You get all these billions of cells and microbes doing your work and creating heat. When I heard that nuclear energy the power of the atom, and Bruno, we're coming to you in a sec. Um, the power of the atom was used to boil water and run a turbine. I just about flipped. I was like, we are going down. Like humanity is, if that's why we use 
nuclear energy to boil water, basically a kettle of water technology. I, I really, it, it was a shocking moment in my, in my upbringing. Uh, okay, so I hope that frames a little bit of our conversation and then we'll go next. Bruno, what, you've got your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, so just kind of my point that I was kind of thinking about before, but I didn't really know how to phrase it, um, is around kind of those carbon credits I think we've been talking about here and how, yeah, I feel like it is, it is an interesting concept in terms of the gamification of essentially carbon sequestration and also, you know, benefiting those that are actually doing, you know, work on the ground and having a way to, you know, actually have a reward for them doing this work, kind of similar to a lot of the government subsidies that, ha that they have for corn in America and different types of products across the world. So I feel like in that, from that sense, it makes a lot of sense and I, I completely understand it. But then when you look into like the definition of what a carbon credit is, it's essentially a credit that allows you to emit a certain amount of CO2 and gives you that permission, which I feel like at least in, you know, from the examples I've seen of it being used, is usually used by big corporations, you know, I don't know, oil giants or whatever it is. And as kind of like a, uh, as kind of a way to hide that, all of the damage that they're doing to the ecosystem. And similar to what I've heard about biodiversity credits, I'm really not sure how those would work, but does, yeah, does me buying a biodiversity credit give me the right to, you know, extinct some animal or, or make another, you know, kill some sort of endangered species just because I bought this biodiversity credit. I feel yeah. like it doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't really add up in, in my, like, my way of looking at it. You know, if I cut a tree here and I plant a tree somewhere else, that's not the same thing. And I shouldn't, it shouldn't be equivalent, you know, at least from my perspective. And I, I want to know what other people think and how, you know, how, how they would argue to this point. Uh, but yeah, that's just how I look at it. Like one, one piece of damage in Latin America does not equal, you know, planting a tree or building or digging a swale in, you know, India, because you're damaging one ecosystem and, you know, helping another ecosystem, but they're not at all related. You know, they're completely unique climates and with completely unique species. And Has, it, has anyone thought about this? I, it seems as though that this is a, um, a, a, not common, but it's, it's sort of like a, a something that, that people have addressed. Um, because it, it is, it's, it's a, it's the big elephant in the room. It's just like powerful people will just buy up this thing. And it's, a, it's kind of like the mindset is wrong. Is that where you're getting at Bruno? Yeah, exactly. I, I'm so in support of like regenerative projects and I want to, people to invest in those projects, but I don't know. And if I, I plan to have like a regenerative project for a fun 10 and I, obviously I'm thinking like, do I use carbon credits as a way to, you know, bring funding to this project. And I don't know, because I don't know if I fully agree with the morality of, of having this kind of credit that allows you to do something negative. I, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's like, if I save 10 people's lives, do I get a credit that says I can murder one person? <laughs> so nice. I can sell that to a murderer and then they don't have to go to jail because they've bought 10 murderer credits. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they it saved breaks... 100 people, but killed another 10. It's <laughs> like, something, yeah, it's something that sort of breaks down and it does feel like it's part of like a centralized, I, I don't know, it doesn't feel right to me. I, I'm kind of curious what, what other folks think of. One comment on that, uh, when you say what can I quickly relate to is that Christianity in the mid middle, like 1500s, when the Pope was able to get a, a free credit, people pay and do the crime. So they will pay for a crime uh, and the church will forgive them and then they will commit the crime. So it is like <laughs> almost you are kind of seeing it in a different way. Uh, but the thought process, again, we are looking for is uh, uh, how do we bring these uh, knowledge or awareness so that uh, how to look at it in a lot more holistic way. And uh, everything is interconnected. At the same time, everything has its own local economy. So still, how do we put these pieces together? So the decentralization, in a way, says the localized sections can be decentralized. And then at the same time, it can collaborate as a total. And uh, um, I look forward to that kind of energy coming from it, meaning not to get down, bogged down by the negative, but to question it and see, okay, how to come forward from that. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Uh, any... Yeah, small addition, like um, 
in terms of sustainability, I think it probably yeah, it probably aligns with that term a bit better than with like regeneration or permaculture because ultimately what you're doing is kind of essentially an equivalent uh, of obviously like I said it's not an equivalent but it's essentially trying to make it an equivalent when obviously yeah obviously things are so unique and yeah I feel like maybe there should be some credit but maybe it shouldn't be a credit that gives you the right to do something but it's more so something that encourages uh, regenerative acts or it can be used so similar to Sean's litter coin it's you can get a litter coin by doing something good but you can only use a litter coin in some somewhere that does good so rather than being exactly like how this system is made where it's like at least the centralized version i'm not so familiar with like these decentralized protocols i'm kind of getting to know them now a lot of like the regenerative finance space but from the from what, how i look at like how tesla uses them it just seems like yeah it doesn't really add up uh in the end, you know, but uh, I see Ryan and um, Dylan's got the handle, so I want to hear from them. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Dylan, I think maybe you first and then Ryan, let's do that. Yeah, so there's a couple of good points there. And I, I, I think the way that carbon credits are used needs a, a, a bit of a, a rethink because, yeah, you shouldn't, it should be encouraging more sustainable activities rather than yeah being a, a band-aid for for what people are doing uh it's it's all about the prevention rather than sort of trying to bring in a cure to a, to a problem you want you want to prevent it so uh my focus on sort of carbon credits or or even just esg reporting is more on Getting, getting the process right so other people then can come in and validate their systems, uh, try and get more sustainable activity and processes happening throughout like the, the whole scale of a uh, industrial process. There's the, the issues brought up there with, you know, if, if we're cutting down forests uh, and then planting trees, I mean, it's not always sort of like they're, they're sometimes just plant monocultures, which aren't sort of environmentally good for for areas you need that you need that variety in the biodome for for all the animals to to be there and you you need those native species for those native animals to to thrive um so there's a there's a lot involved in this and um i, I totally agree that um it's a shame if it's being see, seen by the big companies as just you know a way of you know being able to offset their their problems while they're not actually doing anything themselves to try and fix it. Yeah, and I hope I hope most of them I hope most of the environmental engineers and and people like that that are looking at these things uh, do understand that uh, and are able to push through the bureaucracy of companies and the red tape and the the profit margins and everything like that to to improve you know all these big companies and smaller ones just to improve because if everyone can improve a, a little bit which i think that's the that's that's the benefit of benefit of humanity as, as time grows and there's more knowledge and people understand these things uh they can be put into practice they do take time but there is follow through and um that I know that people are trying and, it, and it, it's, it's hard. If you've got a system in place and it's working, it, it's hard to just, you know, totally change it if, it if it then means that, you know, you're no longer profitable and you can't run your infrastructure or service anymore. But to do the little steps along the way is, what, is what's needed to be more sustainable. But, yeah, I mean, there's everything interacts the... You know, problem with losing animals. I mean, that's you know, I, I I hate that idea. I hate extinction of animals. They're they're all you know, every life's precious, and and sad when we we lose animals, um, forests. I mean, and just every sort of ecosystem has their different involvement. And like you know, we we don't know some of these plants might you know this. We're, we're discovering now the, the oldest species in the world, algae, like the benefits of that, and the hundreds of thousands of different algae with all different things in them. Um, and it's like, you know, we could be cutting down plants that have some valuable compounds in them that we haven't discovered yet for 
that could do amazing things scientifically or benefit health. Like it's yeah, it's sad if we're losing things. So yeah, I'm not I'm not for extinction at all. I think we should be thriving what we have and then trying to yeah improve our biodomes and ecosystems and help the animals, but also yeah, just if everyone works together to try and reduce the impact of what they're doing uh, in everyday life, like from picking up litter to industrial, you know, cut down on, on negatives. Uh, that's what it should be focused on, the positive rather than just a Band-Aid. You need the yeah. prevention. Yeah. Yeah, I like that idea of prevention and cure. Uh, Ryan, let's, um, uh, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Um, you know, carbon credits we need to understand that in their current iteration, uh, I, I really feel they weren't designed to fix the problem. They were lobbied upon and agreed to, you know, placate, if you will, the masses um, through business and, and business and governmental interactions. So, you know, if there was a if there was a free market on it and, it, and the prices weren't set for carbon uh, by governments, um, you know, I, I think it would go a long ways. You know, if there was, if you have a forest, if you have nanotechnology, if you have an algae farm, and, and you can show this is the amount of carbon we sequester, you offered that credit marketplace. Oh, it's like he's, did he freeze up? Oh, did I? Nope, I might have froze. Yeah, but a free marketplace, you know, be it. Um, sorry. Huh. Out, out here in the woods on Starlink. It's good most of the time. Um, it's okay. Hey, hey, Ryan, are you in uh, on the regular one or the business one? Uh, the regular one. Oh, okay, good to know. A huge improvement over the uh, previous yeah, microwave dishes and stuff like that that I can get in this area. Um, but it, it, it's very good. Uh, but, you know, it needs to be a free marketplace. We don't even have the price of a carbon credit. You know, as right. far as industrial solutions go, I think there's one in Canada that can do it for 600 a ton, but they don't have any of their embodied carbon built into that. You know, these are very metal industrial processes that they emitted a ton of carbon to build. Um, you know, if the, if the market for carbon credits is 600 a ton, uh, it makes nanotech and algae and, and regenerative farming look much better. You know, um, it really needs to be a free marketplace, but we have to add a whole bunch more information into it. And, and, and I don't think that government and regulation is the vehicle to do that. You know, I, I'm here tremendously for decentralization and uh, I, I have problems inserting uh, government in the middle of uh, what, what, I, what I want this to end up being. Um, you know, imagine, I know we pass a huge infrastructure spending bill And I figured out that it, it would be four tons of carbon for every resident of the United States to spend $1.7 trillion on infrastructure. That, that's a yearly allowance for each of us. Um, you know, government emits a ton. And, uh, you know, until we have true accounting, uh, I, don't, I don't know. You know, we're, we're a ways away. Let's, um, let's hear from... Um... You know, Danella, if you've got something real quick, and then we'll go to George, and then over to Bruno. Thank you. Uh, my comment is that um, when we're talking about a free market, uh, what is important is to understand uh, that it's just a label. So people might like to call something a free market, but there are always rules, and uh, it's key what kind of rules are here. Uh, because uh, what we are doing with uh, carbon capture and the price of carbon, uh, we are shifting um, 
uh, emissions between different uh, time periods. Uh, so like we're saying, we are paying some money today so that at certain point in time, the emission uh, is taken out. So like we're shifting, like with uh, borrowing money, you are taking money from the future and spending it today. With uh, price and carbon, we are uh, doing this very important regulation of uh, the economy, saying you should invest in the carbon capture now because you will get that much money in the future. And uh, the problem uh, with uh, the market is that a big part of the market today is essentially the venture capitalist uh, economy. Uh, basically an ecosystem. So uh, it's not priced by the market, it's priced by the venture capital uh, investors who judge a particular project, a particular technology, and then also the governments do that when the government, give, for example, the United States government, uh, uh, when they were given uh, out $4 trillion, they spent, uh, they allocated like $2 billion for uh, carbon capture and storage facilities. Uh, so it's not a market. Uh, it's people making decisions, their judgments about what actually works, what is valuable. And very often these judgments are incorrect and not based on fact, not based on science. And you can't criticize them because you cannot criticize the federal budget of the United States. Uh, it's like, uh, it's not up to us to criticize. They just pass it uh, in the parliament. So uh, what is important here is I think to shift our understanding from talking about a free market to uh, talking about how these decisions about pricing uh, carbon, carbon extraction, carbon storage, investments, etc., how it actually uh, set up. And here, when we're building, a, for example, if we're building a decentralized system, uh, we will have all the rules and assumptions built in, and we need to understand them. It's uh, more than just saying, okay, let's have a market. That's the point. Yeah, I think exactly what is a free market, how does governments uh, and uh, uh, regulation budgets, um, the, the infrastructure, how does it influence, you know, our uh, emergent decisions? Because that's what to me is uh, a free market. It's just like a bunch of little people according to rules, like how much money or how much stuff you got. And then that rises up. But it is also affected from the top down. So you know, like we build things up and then it affects us. So it's, it's, it's a real, it's a, it's a real safari. And Ryan was, uh, you know what? I'm mindful of the time. I'm mindful of the time. This is the bottom of the hour. So I kind of want to take a little pause. Everybody can like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we've talked to, we've, we've got a good discussion about the free market. Uh, I know that Bruno and George have something to say, but before we get into that, I just want to, I want to uh, just take a little pause so that people can kind of like get their head around the things that we've been talking about uh, and let good ideas percolate up. We let the sound of my voice bring the best ideas to the surface, to the surface. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Bruno, let's, uh, or, or wait a minute, George or Bruno, which one have you got a burning, burning top topic? George, you, you go first. <laughs> Muted, George. Yeah, the other question on the carbon aspect is um, <clears throat> from the, uh, we are trying to equate it at the current point. Uh, so instead, uh, this is also what happened before. So hundreds of years of industrial work in Western world has cost so much and the new developing nations are picking up here and the underdeveloped countries are even lower. They are picking up from there. So how do we adjust this? Because if we look from the Western world, they say carbon, let me invest in carbon. But the underdeveloped country says, invest in people now. We, we need to get to the developed nations level before we can talk about carbon. So it is that inequality we have as a society. So there are, um, which topic, uh, how do we address these uh, as a total and not just and what has happened before should not be uh, left out of this equation, looking at only the future. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. And I think looking at just the carbon is also a very linear way of looking at it. Like carbon, despite 
being you know something that we emit way too much of is actually it's a use uh, carbon dioxide is a useful element uh, or it's a useful molecule that is used by all plants you know <laughs> that you know and all algae that use this so it's not like it's it's not like it's an unuseful chemical it's, it's something that is useful and, and just labeling carbon as bad and something that we need the only thing that we need to kind of focus Nick and Oh, breaking up a little. So Bruno, when you come back, you were, I think we lost you right as like labeling carbon as bad is not, it is a useful uh, compound. And it's, uh, so this idea that it's just carbon is bad and let's get rid of it or something like that. Uh, you back with us? Am I locked up? Uh, farming system so it's like yeah I don't know it's very difficult for me to say that carbon is the only the only thing we need to be thinking about when there's all of these other aspects to to a full ecosystem I agree <clears throat> I, I, I envision a uh, you know a marketplace there's probably six billion people on the planet who use less than four tons of carbon annually um, if not more. And a free marketplace allows them to participate in it and receive the money for those credits, every one of them. You know, if you look in, in some sub-Saharan Africa, they're, they're less than three quarters of a ton a year. And if, if, if we assume the market rate is that industrial process to, to take it $600 a ton, that's three and a quarter tons at 600 a ton that they would be able to trade on a marketplace in $2,000, you know, annually um, to a, a man, woman, or child is, is a tremendous amount and it could be used for tremendous good. And it would also enable the infrastructure and um, funding to, to create and help countries um, develop in a way that Western nations miss the ball on completely, you know, with, with an eye to these carbon markets and an eye to the methane markets and the microplastics and, and the fertilizers that kill soils. Um, you know, I, I don't see the decentralized, decentralizing, including the governments and the, and the businesses to take the leads on this. I see people, and if we accrue these carbon credits through our consumptions, we should be able to trade with other people to offset them. Um, you, you know, that, that's one way, you know, Bruno and George, that I look at it. And, you know, I, I look at what the Western nations have done and how much we've emitted. If there is no current model for how we you know, help six million, six billion people in the world um, to create better industry and stuff uh, by building the way that we have been. Uh, you know, we, we've created this, this climate crisis with a fraction of the population, um, you know, industrializing ourselves and, uh, and stuff like that. You know, we, we, we couldn't even build the simplest house for all the unhoused and not fly past our carbon, our carbon, uh, you know, targets. Yeah, and no, I think that's a good point. And I think maybe that is maybe the key to it is the centralization part and not relying on these government, uh, like how that is kind of governing a carbon credit system, uh, ecosystem. And from there, we can actually say that, you know, monoculture for example is not a, uh, something that be rewarded, but something like, you know, uh, a regenerative uh, reforestry or something like that. Actually, uh, how can I say, it has staying power and it's not just for, it can't, it can't be gamified so I can plant a seedling and say, you know, I've earned five carbon credits or whatever. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. 
you know, and there's a very fond of me. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And, and there's a there's a very real um, science behind that. You know, you're planting a seedling; it's only accruing so much cellulose material a year, and that's that's something that we can measure. You know, in in, in be it forest, be it algae, be it nanotech, that that's all chemical reactions and, and chemical, you know, processes that are happening to um, that we can measure and that we can weigh against these things. And, you know. Yeah, monoculture is of the things for something to produce, which is valuable for the society. It could be an oil, it could be a product, avocados or some industry. So I, for us perspective, it may look like oh, we are getting carbon credit from this uh, avocado cultivation, but as an ecosystem, it is depleting the resources of that uh, entire ecosystem, which cannot sustain. So uh, good, good point, Bruno, like uh, I, the, from ecosystem, how do we look at it? Uh, not purely as a monoculture and uh, uh, to see beyond that picture. Yeah. Yeah, and I think water credits could be a really cool thing, like uh, some way to value, um, you know, like the water table or something along those lines where you can say, okay, the, the, the level of the water in the world has gone up by, you know, five meters. That, that means that this land is, you know, so much more absorbent of the water and it doesn't let, you know, the water run off into the, into the streams, etc. So I feel like there's definitely other ways we can spin this, this carbon credit concept into yeah like uh, something that is more all-encompassing and, and maybe it doesn't need to be a carbon credit it could be in uh some sort of ecological credit or a regen credit that does actually incorporate like multiple things and it does not it's not just being rewarded for a single action but for different types of actions so maybe building like i mentioned before building a swell could be something that is rewarded or you know creating a pond for animals and you know, connecting that with other ponds lower down the stream so that it can obviously overflow into them. That That's actually, could also be rewarded, maybe not with carbon credits, but with some sort of water credit. If it is successful, I don't know how we'd measure that, but I think that's something that can definitely, you know, it's not a chemical reaction, but it's something that can definitely be measured through wells, through, uh, even even through just like the top, measuring like the, actually the chemical uh, chemicals, nutrients in the top soil. Mm -hmm. You could probably find that, yeah, there's actually a lot less runoff of nutrients into the streams, et cetera. And you're actually retaining a lot of the nutrients from just, you know, the dead plants and the fungi that are eating those and the little insects, all of these things. I think they can be measured ultimately. And you can see that there's more life in an area than before, you know, life credits. I don't know if that's a thing could be. hundred percent in, in, you know, Cardano, allows for that with the native tokens. You know, we, we say carbon credits, but we could have a hundred tokens per transaction and, and it wouldn't change the transaction if we're using hydroheads as far as cost of transaction. You know, so we could accrue these and whether or not we bundled them into a, a, a greater thing or not, it, it'd be up to us, but there's no limit to what we could include in these transactions, you know, be it groundwater, be it, you know, CO2 that goes through the plant's roots into the ground, you know, methane, plastics and packaging. And, and, and that's, that, that's a beautiful thing. You know, it's that multidimensional accounting that we can, we can add as many points as we want to track. The ecosystem approach definitely has a huge play. And Danila, like if you, with carbon nanotech, if you do diamonds and if you're dropping in desert, don't do that drop in our <laughs> addresses <laughs> the, you, more than nfts you want diamonds <laughs> what what would you do with uh, billions of tons of diamonds that's the question we, we'll still take it <laughs> we'll see when it becomes that big but we'll take it until we <laughs> okay thank you yeah thanks again yeah I would, yeah thanks for the discussion you know and appreciate all the conversations and ideas. Thank you guys. I need to leave now. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, I'm gonna drop out as well. Good to speak to you all. Hopefully talk very soon, continue these conversations. Thanks everyone.
Bye bye. Thank you. See ya. See you later. Thank you. Okay, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for attending and we'll see you next time.